Today we're doing a rather interesting job, we're doing a heat pump swap. So in this video you'll get a chance to see what's involved in a full heat pump installation, as well you'll get to see the improvements that have been made in heat pump technology over the last decade. We are literally in the middle of nowhere here. And the house we are working at, it's 170 square meters new build. Existing heat pump uh, lasted for 13 years. It was made by Danfoss. Unfortunately, spare parts are no longer available. This model is no longer manufactured. So there's no other option than to change that unit into a new unit. And we will be installing a 7 kilowatt Aerotherm Plus. Why 7 kilowatts? Because 7 kilowatt is rated at minus 7, so at our design temperature of uh, minus 2.4, that unit at the flow temperature of 40 degrees will give us almost 9 kilowatts. So here we have the existing unit, which is a bit unusual by modern standards because it's a combined unit. It's an invented hot water cylinder with a heat pump inside the same enclosure. So Everything apart from the external evaporator is inside the house. Why is it problematic? It's because if you have a compressor inside, any vibration, any compressor noise is inside your property. So what we have here, you can see expansion vessel for the unvented, expansion vessel for the heating system, and we have ground floor with underfloor heating. That's the manifold right here. And upstairs is radiators. I've run my heat loss calculations and I reverse engineered their design and it seems it was designed to around 40 degrees. There's no blending valves on the setup, so the whole setup was designed to run at the same temperature. Inside we have main circulator for the heat pump, that's for heating. Then we've got a diverter valve, this goes to the invented cylinder coil, this goes to the heating. And then there's two more pumps, one for underfloor heating, one for radiators. And there's a big chance this whole setup could have been run literally on this pump here and probably run with higher efficiencies. And right there, that's the pump for radiators. That's the flow from the unit. T goes to the pump to the radiators, then it comes down. And another circulator right there for the underfloor heating. And here on the data batch on the back of the units there you can see that it was rated to 9.8 kilowatts at plus 2 so at minus 2 it must have been, I don't know, maybe 9 kilowatts, maybe 8.5. You can also see that the rated efficiency of this unit or COP, coefficient of performance, is rated at 3 with external temperature 2 degrees and internal water flow temperature 35 so it's rated as A2W35 COP of 3. And what we have here is an external unit or what we call an evaporator. It's basically a heat exchanger that exchanges heat harvested from the air and transfers it in this case to water and you've got two water lines here going underground and what I've noticed is just a plastic MDPE blue pipe normally used for mains water and it's uninsulated in the ground as well which is unusual. And one more thing worth mentioning is that this unit has a really solid and nice concrete base exactly what Simon is preparing over there for our new heat pump. We are at the stage now that we are ready to position the unit on its uh, footings and we've got antifreeze valve connected to the return just one and we also have soak away done now so that's a soak away that's a drain pipe going about 70 uh, centimeters into the ground surrounded by shingle there'll be shingle put on top of uh, this area as well we also have feet fixed to the footings uh, my pipe work for the cylinder is almost ready as well. This is where the old flow and return from the old heat pump was connected for radiators and underflow heating. So I uh, reconnected those pipes and I took one pump for radiators out. I also took a pump that was here for underflow heating out because we're gonna be relying on the circulator in the external unit alone.
primary pipe work is now connected to the heat pump going all the way back to the inside to the diverter so that's completed it's also insulated in a uh, primary pro sealed to the wall sealed with uh, each other where there are miters and let me show you how it looks inside you can see right there primary pro insulation primary pipe work going right here across all the way to the cylinder diverter valve right there so marie has helped me install this heat pump and that's the first heat pump she's ever seen right yep and she's got some questions so i'll explain to her this whole setup uh as i would explain to an apprentice who's never fitted a heat pump uh so i just wanted to have you explain what all the pipes do uh like where they all go where they're coming from just to put the whole picture together so what do we have here we start with those two those two pipes they go all the way to the heat pump. That's the return and that's the flow from the heat pump. So there are only two pipes going to the heat pump. In our case, 28 millimeters copper, because we've got a seven kilowatt heat pump that's roughly about five meters away from this location. So we'll follow flow pipe first. So that's the flow going all the way up here. And the first component after the uh, isolating valve is a diverter valve. That diverter valve is only open one way at any given time. So that's flow from the heat pump. That goes right here to the cylinder. So on hot water mode, flow from the heat pump goes to the diverter, goes to the cylinder to a really large heat exchanger that goes all the way up to the uh, bottom of the uh, cylinder and comes back on the last T all the way back to the heat pump. Once the hot water is satisfied, and that's actually the sensor here that, that reads the temperature of the store, then that diverter uh, goes back to its resting position. And resting position for that diverter is uh, heating. So that pipe here goes to heating. And that first T takes us upstairs flow to the radiators and down flow to this valve here to the underfloor heating manifold. No zone valves, nothing. Upstairs and downstairs, radiators under for heating works exactly at the same temperature, at the same flow rate, or at the same uh, delta T, not like it used to do on the gas boilers. Now, uh, the pipe return comes back from radiators, returns come back from under for heating as well, and they meet on uh, this T right here. And on the return, we have expansion vessel, and we also have a feeling loop, and pressure relief, and auto air vent on top of that bracket for uh, the expansion vessel. That return goes here. This is my do-it-yourself feel and flash point. So I'm going to use that for flashing the system. I haven't flashed the system yet. And that goes back all the way to the heat pump through an isolator valve. When you turn that valve off, there's a strainer that can be cleaned. And when it comes to primary pipe work, heating pipe work, that's it. There's nothing else. And we also have our mains water and hot water here and that's pretty much it so to me those setups are simple really simple very exciting moment now Marie is really excited because we finished it it's all wired system is filled with water no leaks we're ready to power it up So the unit is running now at 70% compressor uh, modulation, so quite high because I forced it to go on heating to check my circulation through underfloor heating, see if I'm getting circulation through radiators. There's no way I can set this system up correctly in this weather. I'll have to come back when the weather gets colder. But what I can confirm is that I'm getting 1.5 liters on average through the underfloor heating manifold while I'm getting circulation to the radiators upstairs. But that I'm testing by just checking flow and return temperature on the pipe work and running the unit pretty hot. Uh, you won't run this unit that hot even when it's minus uh, five outside because this house only requires 40 degrees or thereabouts uh, when it's minus two. Unit now completed running, pipe work fully insulated outside. And also I've installed those uh, deflectors on air bricks because I assumed that if they are in the protective zone then if R290 is heavier than air then it will just go around them and drop to the bottom anyway and then I called Veyland and they said that uh, air bricks going to the cavity wall or to the subfloor they are acceptable in the protective zone I asked them to email me so I'm waiting for an email confirmation for that 
So in here we've got heat pump interface unit. This is where all the advanced controls for uh, the heat pump are. And probably end user wouldn't touch it too much, maybe just to check the efficiency of the unit or check for errors. Then you've got this unit that does most what the heat pump interface unit does. This is what you would probably call mm, programmer, programmer thermostat thing. That this is where you set your heat curve on. This box here is just a wireless receiver for for the for the wireless controller. Backup immersion heater on the cylinder, not normally used on this setup because for Legionella cycle we don't need it. Uh, heat pump can go to 75 degrees C if required at a really low efficiency, close to one, but but it can do it. So this is what a heat pump changeover or heat pump swap uh, takes. And the beautiful thing of this job was that the system was already well designed, so the redditors are sized correctly, pipe work is sized correctly, nicely for a high flow rate on a heat pump. Uh, the manifold never had any actuators, it's always running on all the loops, there was no zoning that's not required. So the heat pump always had as much open system as possible, so it had long run times. And we're gonna leave it at that. That was really well done by the previous installers. What wasn't, however, was that pump on that manifold and the pump for the radiators, which we know, I confirmed it now, is not needed. My calculations told me uh, that it's not required to have additional circulators or any separation on this uh, setup. So the main takeaways here should be Keep your systems as simple as possible. Only use buffers when it's really needed. You will know if you need buffers if you do a heat loss first and then you check your index circuit and you calculate the pressure loss on your uh, circuit and then you need to learn how to read the pump maps from the external unit to confirm that that pump in the unit outside is capable of overcoming your system resistance. These are no gas systems. We're not blending down any temperatures anymore. So keep your systems simple. Don't put any third-party controls. Don't put any actuators on under for heating. Don't put blending valves. Don't put pumps on under for heating. Don't put additional pumps for the systems or separation if it's not needed. And learn how to calculate the pressure loss on your index circuit because you will need that. So you need heat loss, you need uh, pump graphs, you need to be able to calculate uh, index circuit pressure loss. And the only course that I can think of that actually teaches that is Heat Geek Heating Mastery. I will leave a link to that course below. If you haven't done that course and you don't know how to read uh, pump maps, you don't know how to calculate your index circuit, you don't know how to do heat loss calculations, and you are in heating, you really should uh, do that course and learn those things, especially if you want to go into renewables. And let me tell you, the shortage of installers in heat pump world Shortage of installers that know how to install systems well is massive. You learn those skills, you'll never be out of work, ever, I think. Not in the next future, not with this changeover to heat pumps. And as you can see as well, we already are swapping existing heat pumps for uh, new units. If you guys have any questions about what I've done here or in specifics of this job, leave a comment and I will try to reply to every single one. Again. Thanks for watching and I'll see you in the next video.